intermission. So, 12 and a half thousand odd words in, and we've covered the first 15 episodes in varying degrees of detail. Shorter than I'd imagined, which gives me some vague degree of hope I've managed to reduce the amount of flannel my writing style is prone to, and leave out the too much of the larger technical sections that I'm not well enough versed in to properly discuss. Now seems like a good time to take a moment and look at some outlying things. I personally always leave a short break between episodes 15 and 16 when watching the show, which we'll address more shortly. So let's follow suit of that and address the dub as well as the intro and outro songs or the whole OST and soundscape in general. The dub. For me, the dub of Shuffle is a must-watch, so much so that I've never been able to get through the sub as the voices are just so familiar to me in English, which is strange because I'm usually pretty good at swapping between the two mediums, a la Zero no Sukaima. It's an early Funimation dub from before they bought out most of the competition and still had to actively make an effort. As such, there's some really great vocal performances here, and I don't think anyone lets down the team. Is it perfect? Probably not. But it's my belief that there's no such thing as a perfect dub or sub. We only think all subs are sacred because we don't speak Japanese. I'm refraining from a full discussion on my stance here, but generally, if it's from the 2000s or most of the 90s, then go with the dub. It won't change much, if anything, except for the end of the day, the dub that can burn the hill. And in reality, the experience will be closer to what you'd have gotten if you were a native Japanese speaker. That's not to say all dubs are good, far from it. And with dubs from the last decade, from the newer Funimation studio style, it can be a case-by-case -case basis kind of game. With that needlessly said, the shuffle dub really is terrific. It's one of my personal favourite performances from Monica Real, but while she really is brilliant throughout, I wouldn't say she's a star by any measure. Rin, Jerry Jewell, and Primula, Shireen Lee, and really all the cast do a great job, but two performances stand out in particular. Sia's voice actress, Brittany Kabrushki, during her arc has the task of voicing two similar, but fundamentally different people, personalities. And she does it wonderfully. At one point during a confrontation between Sia and Kikokyo, the alter ego, the harsher voice tone she uses for Kikyo softens until you realise they've stopped sounding different, but are rather more sync speaking in sync. It's really impressive, and I don't think it hits quite as hard in the Japanese, that that may be a biased opinion. But overall, Kaide's voice actress, Carrie Savage, takes the cake away. <laughs> takes the cake far and away. At the start of the show, her voice may come off as somewhat shrill, the classic trope of an adult playing a supposedly kawaii anime girl. However, you soon grow to appreciate the nuance of her performance. And when it comes time for Kaide's arc, she shows an amazing range. Her screams of anger and frustration, the get out of my house line that her shivers down your spine, only to be matched by the heart-wrenching, almost ugly cries of sadness she gives later on in the same story arc. To wrap it up, after the arc's resolution, her more sombre, less angst-filled sobs and her attempts to hold a conversation without breaking into tears are really fantastic. It's one of my all-time favourite dub performances and I'd love to hear this voice actress more often. Just brilliant. Opening song and dance. For me, there are anime songs I like but skip on a binge watch. Songs I'll almost never skip, like the first intro of Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood by You, which I'll watch, say, 80 plus percent of the time. Uh, and then there's the 90% plus grouping. Songs and intros I pretty much never skip. Neon Genesis Ava is of course one. And more recently, Revolutionary Girl Utena has joined this group. And for me, Shuffle is the other one that springs to mind immediately. It's packed full of purpose, and the song has a soft spot in my heart. There's an old Kristen V English cover of it that I also love. The intro is full to the brim with colour coding and parallel imagery in order to implant ideas into the viewer of, from the get-go of every episode. Let's break down a few. There's the obvious fact that the title letters are rainbow coloured, and of course the section where we see various characters by their colour on a white background, similar in style to the introspective place Primula's mind retreated to. Then there's the expressive use of different nature elements to show a representation of each girl, except for, in the case of Primula, who is framed behind concrete, a man-made substance. The usual metaphor for Primula goes even further. We have a, brief, a few brief shots of Narane and Sia in Ryu clothes plus settings, representing the fantasy elements they bring to the table, followed by Kaide and Asa living their ordinary lives, indicated or indicative of their more realistic nature, then followed by Primula, alone holding a, the stuffed animal doll on a backdrop of turbines. Now, aside from giving those who've played If My Heart Had Wings terrible flashbacks, this should act as a representation of what Primula is. Not only is she framed separate and alone, which starkly contrasts the others, but also the wind turbine is a man-made object that harnesses nature to produce in energy. Primula is a man-made or man-made person who harnesses natural magic to attempt to create infinite life. It's a neat parallel. 
Another element of the intro that I really like is how the music syncs to the visuals in an unusual way. The song starts with barely any instruments and just vocals, as we get shots of the five girls, each with a close-up. However, as the vocal track cuts out, we get a synth mixed with electric guitar segment, as images of the town our heroes inhabit flash by. However, with the lyrics gone, so too are the people, as the town lies empty, this communicating to us that the setting plays second fiddle to the people, who without their who without there is no colour, something of a prevalent message within the show. As the vocals cut back in, we get to be reacquainted to the characters as they greet one another. It's an interesting technique to have the music and visuals linked like this, and not something I've seen often elsewhere. There's also plenty of shots of the gang simply living their ordinary life, going to school, eating, etc., to help convey a sense of familiarity between the show and the audience. Though this is far more conventional than my previous point, all in all the intro has a sense of energy and pace to match its bop of a track, and it's a pleasure to look for all the little hintful bits of foreshadowing and references to the events of the show. I'd love to go more in depth, however, if I'm out of my element with the narrative and visual components, then I sure as heck aren't qualified to talk about opening songs, so I'll leave it, I'll leave it here for now. The outro is a bit more interpretive. Some points of note in it are the directions each girl look in, which match the arrows at the start of the more light-hearted episodes in the title cards, uh, though this may be a loose connection. More abundant is the backdrop e behind each girl, which portrays their associated seasons, i.e. Sia is standing in the rainy season, as heavily referenced in episode 2, and Primula is behind a winter landscape, which we as the audience associate with her ice magic, as well as her teams of being unnatural and infertile. Party to this is how the outro loops. The spark that blooms into a flower is the same tear that falls at the end. This gives the impression of a never-ending cycle, which is quite apt considering that each girl, Anrin, has to first have their fairy tale broken, fall to a low point, and then rise up above it. Overall, the outro is definitely more interpretable than I've gone into here, and I'd love to hear the opinions of anyone else and your take on it. One thing I've always thought would benefit both the intro and outro is if the animations changed ever so slightly as the series progressed. Nothing major. Maybe Primula have a costume change to represent her new maturity, maturity uh, after episode 15, or Kikyoko's more happy face could reflect or something post episode 17. Something to that effect, anyway. As well as that, I'd say similar could be done with the outro by changing its order so that the girl whose arc is in the focus always comes last, as Primula always being the one crying makes little sense during Sierra or Asa's arcs. However, I can see how moving the winter aesthetic to the earlier in the song would or might change the thematic effect of it all, just as a thought that strikes me from time to time when rewatching the show. To finish out, we have the rest of the OST. It's fairly normal visual novel lineup. I personally really enjoy it, though I could see why it might not blow you away. A favourite track for me is when Kaide loses control, lashing out at Asa, and the score plays a distorted version of the more playful everyday track that we're used to. It's a classic horror movie trick, and it's much appreciated. As I say, my music knowledge is rather lacking, so I shan't use any more of your time addressing the topic, but s to suffice to say, the score serves its purpose expertly, and is a welcome member of the visual novel musical canon. While it may not always match up to canon, plan ads, school days, or grizzia, or the aforementioned If My Heart Had Wings, I believe it still embodies the same spirit of those scores, though it is arguably the weakest element of the show. Mind you, not by much. Now, back to our main feature. Episode 16, Kikyo, and character, Sia. The show's use of parallel teaming, let's now take a closer look at and cover Sia and Kikyo's characters on the far side of our brief intermission. It should be briefly clarified that from here on out we will be mentioning topics such as bipolarism, codependency syndrome, depression, more terminal illnesses, and child neglect. And while I'm better read on some of these than others, I'm no expert on any of them, so please take everything I say with a grain of salt, and if you're affected by any of the issues, please seek out the appropriate help. I sincerely wish you all the best in whatever your may endeavour may be. I listed episode 16 as part of the Awakening arc, while well, listing episode 17 as part of the True Feelings arc. This is because 16 works in the same format as episodes 12 to 15, with Sia being snatched out of her fragile mentality, while 17 is far more like episodes 21, in that while Reen and the respective other are able to come to a peaceful conclusion, Nida triumphs in the way say, we did in episode 50. You could of course divide Shuffle in multiple different ways, one simply being to mark episodes 1 to 15 as arc 1 and 16 to 24 as arc 2, but there's one more nice nod to my system, and that's the fact that once again it matches a character's personality by having Sia's arc be spread over two different storytelling archetypes. With that framing device out of the way, let's get to looking at the scenes, 
and at sea as a character. There's a lot that goes on in these last nine episodes, and far less that we can skim over as we did with, Ep- with Arc 1. Episode 16 deals with Sia's downward spiral into a depressive, self-loading state that had been hinted to since the beginning, leading to her being confronted by her sister, which I believe can be taken as a thinly veiled metaphor for bipolar disorder. The episode has some great minor things of note at its onset. First, there's a rooftop lunch where the characters talk about how great it is that everything is back to normal. Part of what I like about this scene is how untrue it is, simply by the merit of Asa and Kareha being there. It's nothing major, but the use of the top-down wide shots helps to point out how things are clearly different to how they were once before, especially in the closeness of Reen and Asa. Then there's Reen's treatment of the girls. Clever camera work makes it so that during her one scene in the episode, Reen doesn't turn his back on Primula. Meanwhile, Narine leaves school before him, meaning that he never walks away from the two who are now moving forward with their lives. Further, uh, accentuated by Primula's new, more mature outfit and a lack of the toy cat plushie. Well, in the meanwhile, Rin walks away and borderline ignores both Sia and Kaide, uh, but instead is walking directly towards and actively seeking out Asa more than twice in the episode. This culminates in Sia seeing Rin and Asa shopping. After witnessing how happy they are, the camera turns back to reveal her absence, and in doing so, the last piece is in place for Sia's arc. Sia as a character, as already mentioned, is similar to Narine in that she has a degree of survivor's guilt, but more than that a complete lack of self-worth, believing she has no real value and that compared to the others, including Kikyo, she doesn't really deserve Reen. In just ten minutes of screen time in a completely natural way, Sia's personal resolve buckles and she's finally forced to face and to more important uh, to face herself and to more importantly face Kikyoku. Uh, this next scene is the first of Sia's two confrontations between herself and her sister, and there are some of my favourites packed full of more simple, uh, more simplistic but highly effective storytelling. First we see Sia walking home after seeing Rin and Asa at the shops. She's placed a long line of the centre right of the Nine Quadrant, which immediately helps her to look small. This is, when, uh, this is then added to by the sunset, which bathes the whole area in a warm red, making Sia's seemingly vibrant hair blend into its surroundings. The whole shot is great and confides in us what was she's feeling right now, small, lonely and beaten. It's followed by more use of lighting, and to great effect, as we watch Sia walk straight past her father, who still expects her to make dinner, despite the late hour, and into the darkness. Now we know that she's essentially not even seen him due to being lost in Torf, taught and is heading straight to her room but visually we watch her step past her father a god bast in the light of his traditional japanese home and straight into a bleak darkness it's brilliant but all these nice examples of lighting to communicate her mental state are soon overshadowed by what occurs next sia enters her room to hear a voice not quite her own there's so many great shots here starting with a top-down look at her face his reaction to the voice it's downright terrified, and the angle seems to almost shrink all her features. The body she flaunts so openly in fan service scenes now seems small and unassuming. The angle of Sia standing in the doorway, doorway soon arrives, and with it we see her literal shadow now looms large behind her. The conversations between Sia and Kikyo are great. While they may not be wholly accurate to schizophrenia or bipolar syndrome, they never actually claim to be, while still being some of the most easy to understand representations of mental illness in all of anime. She initially comes across as an antagonist, which is a nice touch, as well I'm glad she's eventually revealed to be well-meaning. Her initial hostility adds a layer of tension and risk to the otherwise passive character motive-driven storyline. The mirror, which has loomed over Sia all series long, refer back to the bedrooms, and has frequently reflected a different expression to the one Sia is wearing, is now paid off as the confrontation goes on between the two. That is till you realise Sia and the camera aren't actually looking at the mirror. In fact, it's blank. Kikyokyo is instead standing, legs surrounded in a haze behind the mirror. If a mirror is the gateway to the soul, then she is literally said soul hiding behind the eyes, or visually behind the blank mirror. It's a nice touch, and it can take a couple of seconds before you even realise the discrepancy, adding on an almost spooky element to the scene. Alternatively, the camera keeps returning to see her, but from a far off view, making her look even more afraid and frail. Even her stance backs up, her hands prostrated as though she, as though to pray, and her face partially turned away. The two argue with Sia finally admitting that she doesn't feel worthy to pursue Rin any longer, 
and admitting a degree of guilt at the fact that Kikoko can never find love for herself. In an instant, his expression changes, revealing that Kikoko has taken control of the body. The foreshadowing for this up along in Sia's reflections, as well as when she briefly took control, snapped some sense into Narane in episode 14, come to full fruition here as Kikyo assumes command. I'm really sorry for saying that name different each time. <laughs> I think there's actually something pretty unsettling about this whole thing. The idea that your body could suddenly be grasped from you and your consciousness unwillingly locked away. We also get another great example of Shuffle abusing, or Shuffle's abusing of its animation medium by using slightly harder drawn expressions with narrow eyes to clue in the audience of the change in persona. So then how did we get here, one might wonder? Kikyo seems to be antithetical to Sia. She's overly aggressive, sexually charged and seemingly highly selfish. However, examining her and Sia more closely reveals far more similarities than not. For one, while she isn't as aggressive as Kikyo, Sia is arguably the most forward of the harem group. A fact that comes to a head in episode 10 when she or her father accidentally spread a rumour that she's to be wed to Reen. We've seen her used as a primary fan service character, and aside from Asa later on and what was more of a meeting with Narane, Sia is the only other girl to actually go on a date with Reen. Same thing with the sexuality. Sia is highly physical, often making use of her assets to escort Rin, with only Asa coming close to matching her number of fan service scenes in the first arc. Then there's the selfishness. While well, Kikyo seems selfish, Sia seems up more naive, not at first realizing the effect her actions might have on, on the, no, the other girls, as shown by the daydream, where she envisions her, Narane, and Kaide at their joint wedding to Reen. Asa is excluded due to her lack of um, publicness and her feelings early on, and Sia does question if Primula would want to be there, but she isn't considered a true member of the harem till 22, and therefore not included in the daydream. A closer look reveals something interesting about both Sia and Kikyo as characters. What we perceive initially as selfish or naive acts are in truth acts of harmful altruism. It's maybe the biggest theme of the whole show, but Sia is in fact being selfish in her naively aggressive style towards Rin, because she wants to make Kikyo happy. Conversely, Kikyo only takes control of Sia's body to try and improve Sia's failing life and mental state. Both are acting out of care for one another, but going about it in equally wrong ways. Just like what we saw when Reen sent Primula away, and Narane's loss aversion techniques. So in reality, the two aren't so far removed, something that will get revealed more in episode 17 than 16. Which, before we move on to, let's address episode 16's biggest twist yet. Yeah, its biggest twist yet. Its use of fan service as a plot device. Oh really, it does. At the start of the episode, the gang, mainly Itsuki, discuss how red lingerie is representative of a more confident woman, or words roughly to that effect. Sia takes some interest in this, while Mayumi and the rest of the grouping dismiss Itsuki out of hand in the usual manner. However, astute viewers will notice how normally Sia's panty shots are... are sorry. <laughs> However, astute viewers will notice how the normal Sia panty shots are from here used to aid in the representation of her mental state. This ends during her discourse with Kikyo, when we see that there are ple well, that's nope. her <laughs> that they are plain as possible, expressing her newfound lack of confidence and defeated detrimental mindset. However, when Kikyo takes over and appears in front of Rin at the very end of the episode, the underwear is now a dark, a dark purple shade of crimson. She's gone straight past confidence to a colour more confident than red, and in doing so we witness the use of fan service to further tell the story. Before we move properly into episode 17 and the third arc of the show, the Honest Feelings arc for our purposes, let's finish our analysis of Sia. While at first sight she appears to be an air-headed fan service vehicle, underneath we find a surprisingly introspective young lady with some serious mental hang-ups. Her attraction to the rain in episode 2 immediately clues us in, as we'd expect her to be the Genki type and associate more heavily with the sunshine, yet we catch her in contemplation over the rain. Something else of note is how aside from Rin, our protagonist remember, only Sia has moments of internal monologue. Primula has the dream sequences, but that's more like a coma. This should tell us a lot about her as a person. She's self-conscious. She has to be if she's the only other character allowed a monologue. This lack of self-worth becomes more apparent on subsequent rewatches, as her earlier episode sessions, trying to decide what to wear down to the undergarment level, and her obscene over-planning of her date with Reen, Clue us in that Sia actually does a lot more thinking than one might first think. 
We'd see a similar character arc to this and Taradara's old Genki girl turned reliable best friend Minori a few years later. Sia's story arc and team are that of self-acceptance, coming to terms with the fact that she does have self-worth, and that she does deserve to find happiness, even if Kikyo can never truly in the same way. Which, of course, we see in action in episode 17, Honest Feelings. So it picks up where 16 left off, with Kikyo taking Rin on a date. Straight off the bat, we have a hesitant Rin, though importantly, he still goes along with it. We witnessed the date almost from afar, with particular shots taken from the park, which we visited before, namely with Asa in episode 13. The distance of the shots and the slightly skewed fashion in which Rin and Kikyo are drawn, running and holding hands, makes for a great way to visually show how unnatural their date is, as though even their body language is standing in opposition, a tricky thing to convey through TV animation. The date goes on with Kikyo eventually flashing Rin in the changing room. This is where the tone really shifts from an awkward, fan service -y date to something more toxic. Rather than being played for laughs, the flash causes Rin to become stern and disapproving. While from Sia's internal perspective, Kikyo is essentially abusing their stroke her body. This all links back to a team which we'll return to, of the idea that there is maturity and nudity, even when addressing our most fan service -y character. On a smaller note, there is also a large quantity of mirrors and reflections and the like that inspire those objects, present in these quick cuts and scenes, which is a nice touch. It ends in, yes, yet another, of my favourite scenes. Thankfully, this one is shorter to talk about. We find the duo on the bank of a river, in pretty much the same position as Rin and Asa in episode 12. They're basked again in that same sunlight as the episode prior, which is a nice touch. However, while Kikyo speaks as though they're a long-term couple, Rin is clearly uncomfortable with the direction the day has gone in. Kikyo directly references the beach episode with the line, Isn't it great? It's like we're the only two in the world. But not only is this a nod to that, it also mirrors Narane's actions in episode 15, with the difference being that Narane had accepted herself, where Sia and Kikyo have not. If this was pre-episode 15 Rin, I have little doubt he may well have played along with Kikyo's game, seen the reference to the beach as romantic, and gone in for a long overdue kiss. But this is a Reen, who though not done learning yet, has made some strides forward, and as such does not play along, instead rejecting Kikyo. But let's not be too hasty. This is not absolution for Rin, just yet. For we've still definitely, or sorry, for we're still definitely seeing him in the process of growing up. After all, while Rin does reject her, the right thing to do, all things considered, he arguably does it because of his not so subconscious feelings for Asa. In a sense, a selfish move, but more damning is he leaves Kikyo. Go. He doesn't chase them or visit them at their home like a good friend would. He doesn't even send them a text. In conclusion, Rin grows in this arc, but he's still got a long way to prove himself solidly, as we'll soon see. As for Kikyo, it's not over yet. She returns to the bedroom and we get a second mirror confrontation scene. Right away they make the great decision to have the screen cut in half vertically, which immediately sets the scene apart from the one we'd seen so far. Kikyo expresses a sense of confusion at what happened, but starts out defiant, while meanwhile Sia is less angry and simply remorseful. The scene is directed in such a way as to make it easy for the audience to understand Sia and Kikyo's internal dilemma. As already mentioned, while it may not be wholly accurate, I love how this scene frames her mental illness as something that's okay. Allow me to elaborate. Mentioned, through this scene, Sia properly comes to terms with the reason she's lost faith in her ability to pursue Rin. It's not because she doesn't want to hurt the other girls, but because she believes to be with him would be unfair on Kikyo. Cruel to her, who can never have a real relationship. Furthermore, she also simply doesn't think she's worthy. Kikyo is the one who talks Sia out of this way of thinking. As she slowly loses her composure, she reveals that she never asked for such pity. The art here is great, with Kikyo's face doing as much work to express her feelings and sentiments as her words do. She eventually comes to the point of tears, and this is what makes the scene so great to me. In those tears, what had seemed to be an antagonistic individual, possible personal defect, becomes humanised. The show is essentially humanising a mental illness. What better way to say that it's okay not to be okay? That it's okay to want happiness and to not want to be alone? Then to have a visual representation of bipolar syndrome break into tears as her voice crumbles down to merge with Sia's once and for all, confirming that they are a part of each other. And really that's the point. You can make it even simpler than bipolar. 
In a way, it's a story about realizing that it's okay to want something, even if you have a mental disability. It's okay to pursue what you want, no matter who you are. As Kikyo returns to his body with the word that she'll disappear for good if it means her sister can live and rest easy, much to see his protest, you realize that all this has happened over the span of just two episodes. Everything from Arc 1 was foreshadowed and good build-up was had, sure, but in reality, in just two episodes, Kikyo is introduced, developed, and resolved. Freaking amazing. Follows is one of the show's most beautiful shot scenes, with a seer who's newly realized that Kikyo is not a burden for her to carry, a cross for her to bear, but rather a beloved part of herself. With self-acceptance in mind and heart, she stands amongst the field of flowers that wonderfully contrasts the starkly bleak and rainy setting of her and Rin's first meeting in the rainy town, and finally confesses her feelings to Rin point blank, with nowhere for him to run. Rin can't answer. Well, to be fair, he does answer, just not how she might have hoped, but definitely how she expected he would. The scene is more sombre to the Narane confession, though has a similar line of questioning if, as to whether Rin has already set his eyes on someone else. However, his reaction is a little altered. No longer, like prior, does he defiantly say no. And so Sia blooms among the foliage in full acceptance of herself, vowing to make Rin her husband one way or another. Yet this isn't really what I find important. As mentioned, while he does reject her, uh, her advances, Rin still doesn't really solve the problem. No, instead that comes down to Kikyo and Sia crying it out between themselves. It's something I really like about Shuffle, that it isn't just a show about Rin always saving the day and the other characters making do with whatever scraps of heroism they can attain. But moreover, it works wonders thematically, as we get to see Rin slowly improve, but in a sense still fail as well as working as a nice foil to how Likaris played a large role in saving Primula and Narine, both their respective sisters. In conclusion, Sia and Kikyo have um, the unfavourable position of being the middle story of Shuffle, anchoring as a bridging point between the arcs in more ways than one. Yet it pulls it off magnificently, presenting us with an emotionally charged, brilliantly acted and ex expertly shot short story, about 40 minutes or less total, that could easily have been the plot of a sci-fi life feature film, with the prevailing character themes being those of a lack of self-worth and a need for self-acceptance. End of part 4. I hope you've enjoyed so far, and please come back for the next part if you'd like. Feel free to leave a like or a comment, and I'd love to hear your interpretations of the ending if they differ any what to mine, as mine are fairly vague. Thank you for watching. In the next one.